Greetings, friends. It is I, your mistress. And I, some bloke. Since it is the Halloween season. Okay, you know what? You know what? I don't care. Halloween is a state of mind. It's not linked to a date, okay? <clears throat> anyway, this year we take a look at another classic movie monster. It is time for the werewolf. Werewolf. Oh. Many cultures around the world have had different myths about man transforming into animal, like the were-tigers of India or the were-jaguars of South America, but the werewolf is the most well-known of them all. The name derives from Old English, with were meaning man and wolf meaning, well, wolf. Much like vampires, the rules and quirks of these creatures vary greatly between depictions, both in fiction and folklore. When looking for a werewolf film to cover, it was tempting to try and go for the very first one, The Werewolf from 1913, but it was only 18 minutes long and, perhaps more importantly, is one of many films from the dawn of cinema that was lost due to accidentally being set on fire at some point. So rather than cover a film that would be literally impossible to watch, let's take a look at a slightly more recent, more famous, and actually viewable example of lycanthropy on the silver screen. Actually, that must be really unpleasant for the werewolf being on the silver screen, considering they're, you know, weak to silver. It's, it's the Wolfman. We're covering the Wolfman. Universal's 1941 film The Wolfman, not to be confused with the 2010 remake The Wolfman, is a horror movie starring Lon Chaney Jr. as the titular character. It's part of the classic Universal Monsters franchise that contains films like Dracula, Creature from the Black Lagoon, and Frankenstein, neatly proving that cinematic universes are nothing new, although I can't wait until we get to the Abbott and Costello meet the Avengers part of the cycle. So without further ado, let us mock another classic film, because that's apparently what we do at Halloween now. We have no control over this. It's them. It's them. They're making us. They're making The movie opens with our protagonist, Larry Talbot, returning to his family home after 18 years away. And by family home, we mean castle. He meets up with his father, Sir John Talbot, who, yeah, looks to be about 10 years older than his son. I, I, fair enough. Whatever. Larry is looking to reconnect with his father after his brother's death, and it looks to be off to a good start. What do you got there? Gee, sir, I don't know. Oh, if only there was some way to tell what was in this box. The glasses are part for John's telescope that Larry helps fit with the skills he gained whilst away and won't be relevant again. After John inspects it and finds it his liking, Larry takes a look and peers into the local town. Creepy, Larry. Creepy. So he heads into town and into the antique shop the woman's bedroom was above. Sadly, upon entering, we find that despite everywhere on the internet claiming the film takes place in Wales, that's this bit, she disappointingly does not have a broad Welsh accent. We're being invaded by beings from outer space! Larry asks the lady if she has any earrings for sale. After looking at the merchandise, he describes the earrings that she was wearing when he was spying on her through the telescope. I'm sorry, we haven't any like that just now. Oh yes, you have. Don't you remember? on your dressing table up in your room. Girl, run. When pressed about how he knows about them, he claims psychic powers, which she accepts probably because she just wants him out of the shop. He ends up buying a cane with a wolf and a pentagram made of silver on the top, and the lady, whose name is Gwen, states that this is the sign of the werewolf. Werewolf? What's that? Oh, that's a human being who at certain times of the year changes into a wolf. She also recites a werewolfy poem. Even a man who is pure in heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf bane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. She goes on to say that the significance of the pentagram, which is really more of a star in this case, but we'll stop nitpicking, is that all werewolves are marked with one and that they'll see a pentagram on the hand of their next victim. Larry tries to arrange meeting her after work, but very understandably, she says no. As she is leading him out of the shop, a group of travellers pass by and he has another shot. You know, I haven't had my fortune told in years. How about tonight? No. I get the feeling Larry needs to be told no more often. Fine, I'll be here at eight. So, since Larry is the prince of the fuckboys, he waits for Gwen to finish work so that they can go and get their fortunes told. Thankfully, her friend Jenny also wants to get her fortune told, so Gwen doesn't have to go alone with Larry. Even a man who is pure in heart and says his prayers by night 
They become a wolf when the wolf bane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. Okay, lady, you're like the third person to say this poem. I'm starting to think this might be a werewolf movie. Upon reaching the travellers, they meet the fortune teller, Bella, played by Bella Lugosi. We can only assume that when he saw how few lines of dialogue he had, he just said, I can't be bothered to remember a new name. My character's name is also Bella. I don't give a fuck, I was Dracula. Jenny goes in first, whilst Gwen, inadvisably, goes for a walk with Larry. She confesses that she's actually already engaged, so she shouldn't really be here, which is, you know, true for a lot of reasons. Back with the fortune telling, Bella looks stressed and, good lord, he's a Joe star. No, as stated before, the mark shows him to be a werewolf, so when he sees a pentagram appear on Jenny's hand, well, we now know that she's his next victim. He tells her to leave, so she does with great speed, before we hear the telltale howl of a wolf. What was that? I don't know. Upon hearing a scream, Larry runs to give aid and finds a wolf attacking Jenny. He intervenes, gets lightly mauled, but mostly just beats the hell out the wolf. Like, seriously, he just beats it like it owes him money, then stumbles off before collapsing due to his wounds. Gwen finds him and, with the help of Bella's mother, takes Larry home. Once home, we discover that news travels fast, because as soon as Larry can tell someone to go back for Jenny, a man arrives to tell them she's been murdered. Jenny! Jenny Williams! What about her? She's been murdered, sir. We then see a bunch of the local law enforcement investigating her body. However, because they are very bad at their jobs, it takes bringing in a sniffer dog to notice that there's another body on the other side of the tree. It's the shoeless body of Bella, cause of death, having his skull smashed in. Plus, they find Larry's cane next to him, which is more than a little incriminating. We cut to the next morning, where Larry awakes to his father, a doctor and the local lawman, entering his room. He's asked if the silver-topped cane is his, to which he says, of course, that's what I killed the wolf with. They then tell him that it was found next to the body of Bella. Larry states... I only saw a wolf. Realising how suspicious he looks, he goes to show them his wounds from the mauling to find that they're all gone now, which doesn't much help his case. Fortunately for Larry, he's a member of the local rich family, so rather than drag him to the station for questioning, they just sort of leave him alone because, well, it's all so confusing, you see, and he just, he just needs some rest before they ask him any of those difficult questions about that guy he totally probably killed. They even leave the cane, which is, well, that's... They're just leaving incriminating evidence with the murder suspect? That's, like, the opposite of what they're supposed to do? I'm not accusing him of foul play, Sir John, but after all, two people are dead and I am Chief Constable. That's no reason to make a great mystery out of it. Um, no, that is literally a reason to make a mystery out of it. John's explanation is that a dog or a wolf must have attacked Jenny. Larry and Bella went to help and in the melee, Larry accidentally beat Bella to death. Now, um, John... Involuntary manslaughter is still a crime, John. <sighs> fucking eat the rich, man. Eat the fucking rich. Later, Larry follows Bella's coffin into the church, where he tries to take a peep before he is rudely interrupted by Bella's mother, speaking to the priest, who is most upset at the, quote, pagan celebration. I hear your people are coming to town dancing and singing and making merry. I couldn't break the custom, even if I wanted to. Fighting against superstition is as hard as fighting against Satan himself. I mean, fuck other people's cultures and their differing ways of dealing with grief, am I right? We then cut to Gwen and her father who are being accosted by Jenny's mother, who blames Gwen for her daughter's death. But then Larry enters and they all leave because, oh, I don't know, I guess a murder suspect standing around threateningly with the literal murder weapon would be a little bit intimidating. Larry goes to speak to Gwen, apologising for getting her involved in all of this before her fiancé, Frank, arrives. His dog doesn't seem to like Larry much. Good dog. Frank is, given the circumstances, as polite as possible, but it gets awkward so Larry leaves. Well, there's something very tragic about that man. I'm sure that nothing but harm will come to you through him. Anyway, the funeral slash carnival is here, so fun and dancing happens. Probably a little bad taste you showing up there, Larry, considering everyone thinks you killed the guy, and that's not even getting into the fact that you're carrying the murder weapon. You should, uh, probably put that down sometime. Gwen and Frank see him, and to prove how totally not jealous he is, Frank offers to play a shooting gallery game with Larry. Larry is a crack shot until it comes to the wolf, which he just can't seem to bring himself to shoot. Hmm. He slips off and runs into Bella's mother, whose name is Maleva, by the way, and she lays it all out for him. 
Bell or was a werewolf. Larry's cane could kill him since it had a silver top, and anyone bitten by him would become a werewolf. So, like, you're a werewolf, Larry. She gives him a charm that can break the evil spell, whatever that means, and in return he shows her a bit of nip. I'm gone now. And heaven help you. Once he leaves, he runs into Gwen, who he gives the charm to in hopes it'll protect her just in case this werewolf stuff is true. He goes in for a kiss, but they're interrupted by the travellers packing up since, haven't you heard? There's a werewolf about. Larry panics and races home. He starts tearing off his clothes to find his legs have grown much hairier. Yeah mate, I'd recommend a wax for that, softer regrowth, yeah? So then, are you ready for the money shot? The transformation scene that is the focal point of every werewolf movie? Well, there you go. Hope you like feet. Yeah, it's a little tame, but it was 1941. They didn't exactly have the technology to go all American werewolf on us. After seeing those hairy feet stalk off, then you see the wolfman in his full glory. The fur on his face is made of yak hair, by the way, in case you were wondering. And if you were, what is wrong with you? Also, despite being an animalistic monster, he still had the presence of mind to put a shirt on, which is a little strange. Regardless, he wastes no time and promptly murders a gravedigger, waking up everyone with his howling. They find the poor gravedigger with his jugular ripped open and with wolf prints leading away from the scene. Prints that can be followed all the way back to Larry's bed. Waking up with some serious bed hair, he finds that he too now bears the mark of the werewolf. He quickly wipes away the muddy paw prints just in time to see the local policeman who has followed the tracks to the house. But since they assume it's just a large dog or wolf doing the killing, Larry is safe. For now. The townsfolk gather outside the church talking about what happened, including Jenny's mother who remarks that there were no murders before Larry came back. Very strange there were no murders here before Larry Talbot arrived. I think- Hold your tongue, Mrs. Williams. Do you know that slander? Yes, yes, you can't slander the landed gentry. Go back to slandering the proles. Larry and John arrive, but Larry can't bring himself to stay, what with all the judgmental stares aimed his way. Afterwards, a bunch of people gather at the Talbot house to talk about how to deal with the wolf. Larry finally comes out and says that it's not a wolf. It's a werewolf. Which is met with the expected level of scepticism. Do you believe in werewolves? I believe that a man lost in the mazes of his mind may imagine that he's anything. Regardless, whatever it is, they're going to go and set some traps and try and catch it. So the traps are set, and when Larry ends up on the prowl that night, he immediately stumbles into one. Although they do seem to have used a version of bear traps that are more inconvenient than permanently maiming. But as the hunters are approaching, he will still need to escape. Thankfully for him, Maleva comes to his aid, saying a short prayer to the wolfman as he transforms back into Larry. He opens up the trap and makes his escape. A couple of hunters out searching do see him, but he just claims to be out hunting for the beast like they are, and nobody questions it. Despite him not wearing any shoes. Oh, there goes Master Larry. Don't mention his lack of shoes. You know how weird those rich types are. To round out the night, he decides to smash Gwen's window. Okay, okay, he just throws a rock to get her attention. She lets him into the shop and he tells her that he's going to leave the town. She says she'll go with him, but he refuses. He's now sure that he's a werewolf and responsible for the deaths. He then sees a pentagram appear on Gwen's hand, marking her as his next victim, so he leaves the shop distraught. Just as an aside, we never really got the impression that Gwen was exactly unhappy being engaged to Frank. They seemed content enough when they were together, so it just seems a little bit weird how much Gwen is down for just running away with Larry. Maybe she was just looking for some wild adventure before she settled down, so, you know, when she encountered a guy who spied on her through a telescope, didn't respect her boundaries, and was connected to multiple murders, she was like, yeah, I gotta get me some of that. Later, John confronts Larry, and Larry just lets it all out. He's leaving. Bella was a werewolf. He was bitten. And he even shows him the star-shaped mark, which John just brushes off. That scar could be made by most any animal. See many animals with star-shaped mouths, do you, John? Still, despite not believing any of it, John agrees to help his son and restrains him so that, should he transform, he wouldn't be able to leave and get killed by all the hunters looking for the wild animal. John leaves to join the hunt, but on Larry's insistence, takes the silver-topped cane. However, Larry escapes off screen and is soon pursued by the hunters. Gwen shows up looking for Larry, but instead runs into Maleva, who tells her to come with her if she wants to live. But Gwen has none of it. Turns out that was a bad move, as the wolfman stalks and attacks Gwen. <laughs> oh, 
John comes to the rescue using the cane for the only purpose it serves in the film, as a world-class werewolf beating stick. After a brief struggle, John stands over the beaten body of the werewolf, and as Maleva says a prayer over the body, it transforms back into Larry. When the rest of the hunting party catches up, they say that the wolf must have attacked Gwen, who's okay by the way, before killing Larry. Only John and Maleva know the truth of what happened, and nobody would believe them. The end. And there you have it, the Wolfman. So, how did it hold up? It's comfy. I don't know what it is about films from this era, but there's a quality to them that just makes them feel like the cinematic equivalent of sitting by a warm fire on a winter's day. It's not what you'd call scary by modern standards, but the tale of a character that, through no fault of their own, is set down a supernatural path lined with dead bodies is suitably grim. Not to mention that its ending leaves us with a main character dead by his own father's unwitting hand. Not that that death would stick, as Lon Chaney Jr. would reprise the role of Larry Talbot four more times throughout the 40s. The movie is shot and acted well, and the score is fantastic. Even the special effects do a good job of conveying what they need to, despite the technical limitations of the time. Granted, he looks less like a wolf and more like the suggestion of a wolf, but still. The Wolfman has become one of the more iconic werewolves. And that's despite most of the werewolf lore in the film being inconsistent with the usual stuff like only transforming under a full moon. Also, to be fair, much of what we joked about was really just us seeing the movie from a modern perspective. Sure, Larry does come across as super predatory towards Gwen, but then old movies were just like that. Respecting people as a concept was only really invented around 1994, even if it is still largely ignored. Also, and this is not about the movie really, but the DVD of it we have has some really wonky Photoshop done to one of the old promotional photos to make the Wolfman look like he's got fangs. Also, the disc seems to be from a different release, not sure what's going on there. As mentioned earlier, there was a remake in 2010 called The Wolfman that was... Well, it's a movie that exists, and you can even watch it. You know, if you want. There were also plans to reboot the series as part of Universal's Dark Universe, but yeah, I wouldn't hold my breath over that. So, all in all, the 1941 Wolfman is a nice movie to curl up with on Halloween, or slightly past Halloween. Like Nosferatu that we covered last year, it's interesting to watch solely as a part of cinema history, but like the rest of the Universal classic monster movies, it has a charm that has kept people coming back to it for nearly 80 years. And after all, it is only about an hour long, so it won't take too much time out of your day to go and watch it. I mean, it wouldn't kill you to put some effort into something for once, now would it? Or would it? <laughs> Bye.